Hello, I was asked to also record a uh, summary of lab 6 and I now could kick myself because I was just talking about an hour to you but uh, I forgot to press the record button so let's start all over here. Um, Lab 6 was about the UART and I2C communication but we also for the first time this year used this LCD module which you see over here with its typical scrambled uh, text that you have seen in the lab as well and we will perhaps try to get rid of that um, with a little bit of trick. So let's have a look in the lab instructions. On the first two pages we have the basic connections which you should have made for this lab and I made it as easy as possible for you. That was my intention but a couple of you meant uh, that was too easy and they mangled up everything for no particular reason. Um, so you can see here that there is a straight connection if you line up the 80 mega 328 with PB1, PB2, PB3 and so on and the 24 pin adapter which comes here from the LCD module. So straight over PB2 to pin 14, 3 to 13, PB4 to 12 and PB5 to 11 through the 10 kilo ohm resistors here which are meant to actually get rid of uh, sometimes we had problems, communication problems with the programmer when the LCD module was connected to the same pins because as you see here SCK is the same pin as LCD D5, MISO as LCD D4, MOSI as LCD D7 and LCD as LCD uh, oh yeah well LCD D6 is it's not used for, for our programming at least. Then we also have these wires here, which also some groups forgot from the start. So there's PC2 to number 3, then we have one empty pin here, and then we have PC1 to 5 and PC0 to 6. And the last connection uh, for between the module and our microcontroller was here, pin 17 to PD2, which is here on our microcontroller. You see it here highlighted in yellow as well, what connections were supposed to be done. And I already connected everything here because I just recorded all of this once before without recording it. Um, so here we have the 10 kilo ohm resistors. Here the white wires are the wires going from the microcontroller to the display module. Here we have for later already our RTC module. And the green wire here, yeah, that's our pin 17, which is actually the switch, the push button on the module. So two pages from the data sheet are found here in the appendix of the lab instructions, uh, showing you the internal diagram where we have an LCD panel with its driver controller here, and how it is connected between the LCD panel and the pins on the header. So we have 1 to 24 here. We have the power supply for the LCD up here, plus 5 and ground. And we also have these three LEDs which have a common cathode down to ground. And we have the four switches which are also connecting to ground, which means that if the switch, switch is pressed, this pin 17, for example, here the S1 pin will be connected to ground. So on the side of our microcontroller we have to make sure by means of a pull-up resistor that the corresponding PD2 pin is kept high as long as we are not pressing the button. So the first part then is actually configuring the display and see that everything works with the LCD. And in LCD.h the author Peter Flurry has made it possible for us to configure the pins of the microcontroller very flexible 
to the pins of such a display. It's not necessarily this Ericsson module. I have two different other modules here as well, which use the same type of controller and the same yeah, interface to the microcontroller. So here we have a pin header and here we have a, um, a female pin header which could be used for, for just putting in our cables, for example, like this, so we can connect it up. They use the same type of interface otherwise, and we can choose freely which pins to use on our microcontroller. This has to be configured here, and it was configured from the beginning, so the file on Studium was correct for us, telling us that the LCD data port on the LCD is connected to port B on our microcontroller. And then the data zero pin is connected to the bit four of port B, the data one pin to bit five of port B, the data two pin to bit two, data three pin to bit three. Uh, you see they are in absolute no order and that that's absolutely okay, but uh, this comes from the fact that there is absolutely no order between our pins here as well, because they are not coming in, in order on the LCD connector. But making it easy, we just make straight lines here and then we do it in software and mix the bits in software. No problem here. We will jump over this first code here, which just sends something to the display, and that's just, uh, yeah, that's just it. What we will start with is actually the UART communication program or code here. I copied the code already into uh, Admiral Studio, Microchip Studio. And let's go through this code quite uh, quickly here and see what everything does. We tell our compiler that our CPU is running at one megahertz, one million hertz. We include our two standard libraries, which we had in every single uh, project since the start. It's io.h and it's delay.h. We also include stdio, standard io because we want to use, I want you to use sprintf here in order to format a message, put it together from a text and a numerical value. We also include uh, the interrupt.h here in case we want to use the pin change interrupt or the, the external interrupt of our microcontroller. And we are including the .h file of our two libraries from Flurry the LCD library and the UART library. We have to include them in our project over here as well. And oops, I see I'm in the way here. Uh, hmm. Let's get myself out of the way uh, by actually grabbing myself and putting myself down here. Okay. Now I'm not so in the way anymore. I didn't notice this before. So we have here the Solution Explorer. If you don't see the Solution Explorer here, then it's because you are in VA View or VA Outline, which I must honestly say I have not a clue what they're used for. I have never used them. So what I always use is the Solution Explorer here, and uh, there we see the files which belong to our project, our current project. Interestingly enough, if I highlight our project on this side and go to the main menu project here, I actually can choose Add Existing Item from the main menu, which is exactly what you need to do in order to add libraries.h files and .t .c files into your project. But if I'm in my main file here, editing ahead, uh, then actually I have a different menu in project, which I don't really understand why and uh, well. So we need 
LCD.C, LCD.H, UART-C and UART-H in our project. But in our main.c we only include the .h files because they are telling the compiler what is defined in the library without actually including all the library code. The library code is in the .c files and they will be compiled at the same time as we compile our main.c file and then the compiled code will be linked together into our final code which we upload into our microcontroller. We continue and define a macro with the value 1200 and call it baud rate. This will be the speed for the communication of our UART, 1200 bits per second or 1200 baud. In the init we first initialize our LCD. Since we have an LCD, we could use it then to actually display error messages. We don't do so, but uh, therefore it would be good to actually do this first. There could still be an error actually uh, configuring the LCD, then you couldn't see anything on the LCD. But if you have the LCD working, you can always use it for uh, putting out messages to the user that something is wrong. So it's good to initialize it first. In UART init, we are actually using a macro which is called UART board select defined in our library, which gives the UART init the correct parameters to set the board rate, which we want, 1200 bits per second, at the CPU frequency which we have, which is 1 megahertz. So here stands essentially 1200 and here stands a million and this routine calculates whatever UART init needs to initialize the UART in our microcontroller to the correct speed. In the next row here we activate the pull up for pin 2 on port D and this is needed for our switch as said before. So this switch here, green cable connected to uh, PD2. And now we also have the pull up active. So when the push button is not pressed, then we actually get a one here in, on, on the pin. And when we press a button, we get a zero. And we switch on all global interrupts. Um, the thing is, this is already done in the background inside of UART init because the library itself uses interrupts. It uses the receive and transmit interrupt of the UART. And it does so to actually handle the output of characters over the UART. And we can see here, if we look in the UART.h file, that uh, it says something about a circular receive buffer and a circular transmit buffer. So the library gives us a 32 character long buffer for transmission and reception. When we print out something to the UART, it will end up in this buffer first and then in the background, because the UART is quite a slow peripheral, in the background Whenever a byte has left the UART, the UART interrupt service routine will make sure to take the next byte out of this buffer if there is any byte left in the buffer and then send that out as the next character. The same if we are not actively receiving data or looking for data from the UART, Whenever a new byte has been received by the hardware, it will be put into the receive buffer until that buffer is full. Then, of course, it cannot take uh, any more bits or bytes in. So, in the main, uh, we are defining uh, three global variables here, but uh, after we've done so, we go and run our init function once, doing all of this stuff which we just went through. Then we have, uh, I already added something in the previous <laughs> recording without recording it. Um, this is the original code from the lab instructions, which was actually just checking 
for the put uh, the push button to be pressed. So what we have here is the input state of port D and we are using a logical end with the number 00000100 as long as this parenthesis here gives us a true value we stay inside this row we are not leaving this row while this statement is true and this statement is true as long as the corresponding bit at this position in the variable pind is also a one because then we have a one and a one which gives us a value of four for the whole expression a value of four is true and while this is true we stay here but once we press the button we get a zero at this position here in this variable and this means that the whole expression will turn into zero zero is considered false so the parenthesis gets false and we are leaving the execution of this empty bracket here and continue in our code so without the next two lines let, let's take them out of the equation for a second here and recompile this code for just in a second and see what happens um, i just have to forget that i not use anything else in my clipboard now so the rest of the code adds one to the variable i there's also different ways of doing that but we are using this here comes sprintf a magic command which is very powerful and there's more details about this command in the snippets file document which I put up onto the lab six files again it was already linked on on the third lecture in this course but in case you missed it here it is once again it contains a lot of practical small code pieces and explanations for using C together with our microcontrollers Ex examples which you might uh, recognize from the labs what the different operators do and how they look some uh, remarks about pitfalls uh, which you should be aware of and uh, so it's good to have I think for later on when you are doing your project in the 10 credit course for example here it describes what sprintf does so sprintf has three arguments essentially it has a first argument which is a text buffer a memory area which has to be reserved and we do it here by actually defining a 40, a 40 character array called buffer it has a template string which consists of plain text characters like message and the space and placeholders percent starts a placeholder and then comes the description on how a variable a numerical most of the time variable should be formatted in order to be or before it is printed put into the buffer for printing it for example to an lcd or somewhere else in this case it refers to the variable i here and the formatting should be done using three characters three places three digits and an unsigned integer format so it will take the value of i and make sure that it fits into the three characters which are reserved for it so if our number is only 20 it will lead actually a leading it will leave a leading space in front of the number in the character if, if you have the number seven for example it will leave two leading spaces in the in, in the message and that is then put into the buffer this buffer is then printed on the display on the LCD here at the or starting from position zero zero 
our LCD starts with character 0, row 0, and then we have character 0, row 1 here. So number, numbering starts at 0, as it does normally in C code as well. And for the bits in our microcontroller, so 0, 0 is the top left position on the display. We take the same text and send it out over the UART. We wait for 50 milliseconds, then we go to the first character in the second row and we check if we have incoming characters in the receive queue of our library, essentially. And if so, then we are putting them onto the screen. And this goes fine if we receive less than 16 characters. But uh, the 17th character will in some way roll over and I'm not completely sure where it goes. But that's why we see this messed up display because it probably stop, uh, continues writing in the upper row or it scrolls one row up. I'm not completely sure what it does. Um, so for a real project, for a real world application, you should make sure that you're not outputting things to this screen, which exceeds the visible area of the screen, because you never know what happens. So we have compiled the code. Let's upload this version of the code, which does not contain the uh, extra rows. We say program here and we go to the project and we have a blank screen here but only until I press a button. Because currently now, right now, our microcontroller sits in this row and checks all the time the status of the D pins, particular D2 down here. If I now press a button, I put a zero onto the green wire, which goes to the microcontroller and our code our microcontroller will recognize that there is a zero and this row will become false. And we will leave that row and we will read, write something onto the screen. We wrote actually two things because it's already message two. If I press again, it's message five. So one pr my, uh, button press gave me actually three passes through our loop here because every single pass it would only increment i by one. So this seven was two passes through, now we have three passes through, we have three passes through. If I press it down for a longer time we actually have an auto increment here as well because every time we get back to the first row here this is immediately false and we continue with the rest of our code again and then we go up here and go through this again and so on. So what was here in order to prevent this? Well if I do a control Z here we have it back. The reason for the behavior is that we have something which is called switch bouncing which means that we, if you have a mechanical contact and press it down, then the mechanical contact will most of the time bounce a couple of times and when we release it, it will bounce again. So we instead of just a single contact making, we get a couple of ones and zeros. And depending on where we are in the code, we will recognize these also as a couple of zeros or ones. But what we can do is that we first wait here for the button to be pressed. Then we give the system a, a short delay to actually get past all these vibrations. 50 milliseconds should normally be enough. 50 milliseconds, 100 milliseconds, something like this. And then we have another while loop with the inverted argument here which will actually wait for the push button to be released again. So, as I said, as long as the push button is pressed, we have a zero at position number two in this variable. 
then we have a logical AND with this number. A 0 and a 1 gives us a 0 and this means that the whole parenthesis is false. when the button is pressed. So then if we invert this false with the exclamation mark then suddenly we, we have something which is true while the button is still pressed. So once we release the button this inverted argument for the second while loop will get false. And while false would mean that we leave this line and continue with our code. So let's compile this code and observe the differences. We go here, we upload the code in our microcontroller, we transition to our view here, and now I press a button and nothing happens on the display. I still press a button right now. I now release the button and we get exactly one message. I press it again, we get our second message. I press it again, we get our third message. Fourths, fifths and so on. Exactly one message with every key press. So now let's see what happens if we take a wire and connect the transmitted data of our microcontroller to its own receive pin. So data is coming out of pin 3 and we put it back into pin 2 of the same microcontroller. If I now press a button we will probably see a lot of garbage on the screen because while I connected this cable this connecting will be recognized by our UART as a lot of bits coming in. So I press and no, it actually didn't. It, it looks quite okay. Um, I mean, it was obviously um, interrupted here at the end uh, and didn't press print out the full message. Also now it didn't get all the way here. Um, but uh, this, this looks nicer on the display than, than what I've seen so far uh, myself, so actually it looks quite okay. So the upper row shows us what we are sending out, the lower row shows us what we are receiving. And obviously after the G there is a, a break here for some reason and uh, then it continues with the previous message. We had just sent out message 31 but it only shows us number 30 here. If I press again then we get the 31 here. And this is probably because uh, the transmission is too slow and our loop is actually exiting here before the last character of the message is actually sent. So this message here belongs already to message 33, uh, 32, while the E and 31 is still from the previous message. Again, this is just quick and dirty code. It's, it's not uh, the nicest code ever, uh, but uh, yeah, it should show you how UART transmission works. Now you were supposed to connect also the oscilloscope and I have the oscilloscope here on the table with its probes, but instead I will show you and explain what we see on the diagram in the lab instructions, which was recorded using a logic analyzer. For about 20 euros, 20 dollars or 200 crowns you can get an 8-bit logic analyzer like this. It's USB connected and it's supported under all operating systems using a free software tool which is called PulseView. And this cheap gadget here can help you a lot if you are debugging projects, microcontroller projects. Because it can not only show you the state of logic pins, it also can decode and analyze 
different types of uh, protocols. For example, oops, for example, it can decode UART messages. So in the lab instructions, we see this picture here, which is taken in pulse view. And uh, what we see here is the actual bits on the wire leaving the UART in our microcontroller. In the idle state, the pin is at a high level. And then when the transmission starts, the microcontroller UART will draw the pin to a logic zero. This is the start of a new character. The decoder down here in pulse view marks this start bit in blue. And this bit is always the same length as all the other bits, but it is always a zero. And then comes eight bits of data. So we have a one, a zero. This is two ones, another zero, another two ones, and another zero. So if we count, we have one, two, three, and four, five, six, seven, and eight bits of data. After the last data bit, our UART goes back to a logic one, because for the next byte to start with a start bit, the cable has to be at a logic one level. So the stop bit, the ending of a transmission, is always a logical one. And then comes the start bit here for the next character. And uh, our decoder here actually decodes this bit pattern as the letter M, E, double S, A. And so this was obviously message 29, which was sent out here. Um, but this is how the UR transmission looks. We start with a start bit, which is always zero. We end with a stop bit, which is always one. And between we have our payload, our eight bits of data. And uh, yeah, this is how the decoder works and how UART works. Then there was the uh, project, the next project, which was actually meant to replace the waiting for the key and sending out of the message with an interrupt service routine connected to or triggered by the external interrupt pin int zero, which is actually the same pin that we have connected our, our S1 switch to. If we look here at the pin out of our microcontroller, we see that the pin four here is not only PD2, it is also int zero. And that means that we actually can use an interrupt service routine which checks whatever happens on this particular pin. The necessary part of the datasheet of the ATmega is also found in the instructions. So we actually have two pins. We have int 0, int 1. But we will only look at int 0 for now. So we have two registers, again, which control the hardware functions of our microcontroller. One is the EICRA, the External Interrupt Control Register A, described in chapter 13 of the datasheet, and it has four bits. The ISC11, 10, and the ISC01 and 00. ISC1x belongs to int1. I see zero x to int zero. And it was going back here. It was int zero, which we're interested in. Int one would be pin five, P5. 
PD3. So in order for the interrupt to work for us, we will have to actually tell the microcontroller with these two bits what should happen or on what conditions the interrupt service routine should be started. We can choose a low level of int 0, which would generate repeated interrupts as long as int 0 is still a low level still connected to ground. We could trigger an interrupt whenever we detect a logical change on the pin. So when it goes from 1 to 0, which is pressing a key, or from 0 to 1, which is releasing a key. Both of these would actually trigger the same interrupt routine. So in the interrupt routine, we would then have to determine was the key pressed or released. But that's possible. We can also trigger just on the falling edge, which means the transition from 1 down to 0, which is what we have when we press the button, or on the rising edge when our pin goes from a 0 level to a 1 level, which is when what we have when we release our button and the pull-up resistor will draw the pin up again. So the suggestion was actually to have the interrupt service routine to react on the falling edge of interrupt zero. So we would use one zero in these two bit positions. A one here, a zero here, and it doesn't matter what we do here, so it could be a zero zero, which it is from the beginning. When our microcontroller wakes up, the initial value is zero for all of these bits. Then we also have to actually allow the interrupt zero interrupt to happen. And this we set in the variable or register which is called EI, external interrupt, MSK, mask register. So here we can set a one to whichever of the two interrupts we are interested in. We would be interested in int zero, so we would put a one here and we would add an interrupt service routine. So let me just grab this interrupt service routine here and copy this into our code up here perhaps. We would need the configuration of these two registers and I don't know, yes the code is here was the code is here like this. We copy also this code and put it into our init, which is here. Let's put it at the end of the init over here. I got the page number for some reason as well. So currently it had now it has uh, recognized EICRA as well. And here you see we are shifting a 0 into bit position ISC11, a 0 into ISC10, a 1 into ISC01, and a 0 into ISC00, and a 1 into int 0 in this variable. And then we are enabling global interrupts. In our interrupt service routine, we have the same that we had before. We assemble our message and put it onto the LCD, send it out to the UART, and then we make sure to return to the first character in the second row of the display. So with this, actually all of this in the main routine is obsolete and can just go away. And the only thing left in our main routine is now the checking for new characters, new received characters on the UART, which will then be printed onto the LCD. Hopefully just in the lower row, but as soon as we are receiving more characters um, than 16, between two interrupts, then we will not return to the 0-1 position and it will be ending up somewhere else on the screen.
But other than that, uh, this should do. Now we will get the warning down here for unused variables because we have the variables i and buffer, which we declare here, but we never use them. So let's have them show up. Oops, they didn't show up. Yes, they show up here. The unused variable i and the unused variable buffer. So our compiler thinks something is wrong here. Uwe has declared variables which he never uses. So why does he declare these variables in the first place? There must be a mistake um, by him. Probably he did a mistake and wanted to use these variables. Um, no, they are just a leftover from before, so I can actually remove them from here. Like this. Recompile the code. No warnings. Upload the code. transition to our project here and now what we see is about the same as we had before we have a blank screen and if I now press the button we get a message sent and we got a message received here as well um, but now the difference is that our main loop is continuously probing for data from the UART. Is there any new data from the UART which has been received by the library put into the library's own buffer? Because that's what happens here in the background. We could do differently. We could actually use an, our own interrupt service routine on the UART receive vector to actually handle all the reception of the characters as well. But uh, yeah, that would break the, the necessity of the library in, in the first place. So actually, yeah, it works quite well. What happens if I press the button continuously? Well, same, no, nothing else happens because we are just once going interrupt into the interrupt service routine when we have the transition from a logic one down to logic zero. I release the button, I can do this transition again. Let's try what the data sheet suggested, try to do an interrupt on whenever we have a low level on int zero. I have the expectation that we again get a repetitive execution of our code, but I'm not completely sure. So that would mean that this one has to go away and be replaced by a zero because we want to have zero zero in these two bits. We compile the code and itchy fingers, we want to upload the code here and oh yeah, you didn't see the changes which are made. Sorry for that. Um, so in the data sheet, it said zero zero is what we want. Zero zero is what we get now, what I compiled, uploaded and Let's have a look how it looks. I press once and we are already at message three. I <laughs> and we are locked up already. <laughs> yes. Um, we went too fast into our interrupt service routine without it giving giving a chance to send out the bytes which were uh, sent which have to be sent out. Um, yeah. Yeah. That's what I mentioned in the lecture as well. Exactly the, this same problem. We can, on the other hand, uh, try out a different combination here. We can try the rising edge of int zero down here, one one. Uh, one here and one here. Now the interrupt should be triggered whenever we release the button after before pressing it. Upload the code, transition and I press the button and we have still nothing on the screen. I release the button and we got message one. I press the button, nothing. I release the button, message two. Press the button, nothing, release, message three. 
4. And so on. Seems to work. Okay, that's good enough for our UART now. Let's go to the I2C communication with the real time clock. So we scroll down here. And this is the real time clock module which you have been using. And it, it's yeah, it's exactly the same that we have in the lab boxes. They come in slight different variants, but this is exactly the same. And it contains a chip which is called DS1307. The full data sheet you can find on uh, Studium, linked there. And this is, if you want to have a look at the full data sheet, here it describes how the I2C transmission is actually uh, looking with different minimum and maximum times. Um, it shows how the chip is constructed on the inside. Here we have the quartz crystal oscillator with the external quartz crystal connected to the pins X1 and X2, which gives us a 32,768 Hz or 32.768 kilohertz signal here, um, which is then divided down. If, if you divide it by 2 to the power of 15, you get 1 Hz which is then actually used to update the timing information inside the calendar chip or clock chip. So we have these different registers here. It has eight different memory locations internal for, for timekeeping. It also has 56 bytes of RAM if you want to store something there. Um, and uh, you see that the fields are marked seconds and 10 seconds, minutes and 10 minutes, date and 10 date, year and 10 year. So the format which is used by this chip is called binary coded decimals, BCD, and it uses four bits to count to code the numbers zero to nine. We could actually have four, uh, 16 different uh, states for four bits from 000, which is 0, to 1111, which is 15. But uh, this format only uses 0 to 9 to code the seconds decimal in these four bits and then the 10 seconds decimal in these three bits because 10 seconds go only from 0 to 5 for 50 seconds and then uh, 50 seconds would be a 101 in these uh, bits here and 50 would be 000, zero, zero down here 55 would be 101001 because this is worth 1 2, 4, 8, 1, 2, 4, 8. Minutes the same also goes from 0 to 59. So when we roll over after 9 seconds, the 10 seconds will be increased by 1. Then if we are reaching 59 seconds, the next step would be to actually set the seconds to 0, the 10 seconds to 0, and the minutes to add one to this register here, to this part of the variables, with 10 minutes it would add one here. After 59 minutes, for the 60th minute, it would increment the hours by one. If we are reaching nine hours and go to 10 hours, it will increase this bit here. And then the function of these two bits here determine or are determined by whether we are running in AM PM mode or in 0 to 23 or 24 hour mode. Um, yes, I don't know why one would run a clock in an embedded system in AM PM mode, but uh, on the other hand, I don't know why you use feet and inches and stuff like that either. It's the same country which uses this weird format. We have this 
variable here, the, the um, register three, which is the day of week, which goes between one and seven. You are free to choose whatever your starting day of the week is, whether it's Monday or Sunday or Saturday or Friday, I don't know. Um, I usually think of Monday as day one in a week, then day seven would be a Sunday. We have the date, which can go between 0 and 31, but the system, the, the clock itself, is aware of the month lengths. So for a November, it only counts to 30, in December it counts to 31, and in February it counts to 28 or 29, depending on whether we are in a leap year or not, because by the year number here in this register, the chip also knows whether we have a leap year or not. And then we have a status register here, which we don't care about. So if we look at the corresponding code and copy it into Admit Studio, should be able to actually just go back a couple of steps back with Control Z. Well, nah. So I take this part here first. This is the upper part um, with the variable and constant declarations and copy it here. And let's have a look what we have here already. Well, this, this should be uh, taken out. Uh, we have the same here, the FCPU is defined as 1 MHz, telling the system that we are running at 1 MHz. We have uh, two help macros here which convert numbers from BCD, from this binary coded decimals, to normal binary format. And this is done by actually taking the upper four bits, which are the tens, shifting them four positions, multiplying the, re the result with 10. So this gives us then the 10 seconds part and the 10 minutes part of our value. Then it takes the same value and masks off only or lets only through the lower four bits and adds this to the result. So this here gives us the tens of minutes times 10, positions them correctly, and here we are actually adding then the singles, the units of, or the ones of the seconds or minutes to the result. 2BCD does something similar, we take the integer division result by taking our number divided by 10, so this gives us the tens of our number. We shift these four positions to the right, uh, to the left, sorry, and then we are taking the remainder of the division by 10 and or these into the resulting number. We have an I2C device. All I2C devices have an, a hardware address. For our clock chip, this is 0xd0 in the format our library wants it. There's two different ways of actually giving this, but this is the format which our library wants. And as we have seen, we have eight registers which we are interested in. We have the seconds, the minutes, the hours, the day of week, day, month, and year. And we have a status register as well. And this gives us in total eight registers. So up here, this DSREX is the number of registers. And then I define uh, for each register a symbolic name, which at the same time tells us which register number it is in the chip. 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. wherever it is here, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 for the time and date. Go back here. Then we have here predefined values. This actually messed up with some of you. There is an, a line break, which actually makes a non 
comment out of a comment like this. So um, there you could have gotten a, an error while compiling your code. I will actually move this into the next row so that we see it a bit better. And I will make some modifications here. This is a fallback time which actually um, is used when our code checks and uh, realizes that the clock chip is currently not running, then it will have to upload some time code into the clock chip. And here I chose 14.05, 30 seconds, on day 4, the 24th of November 21. Um, today is the 28th, I would call today day 7, and by now it is actually let me see, it's 23.32 until we are there, it's probably like something like this. It will be later even. Then we have a global definition here or declaration of a field, an array with eight registers called DS1307 registers. This will be used as a scratch pad, as a notepad, as a clipboard. Um, taking up the copy of the registers from our clock chip when we want to see and manipulate them in our own code so that we have a variable in or yeah, eight variables in our code which are corresponding to the oops, to the eight registers in the clock chip. So let's go for the next block here in the instructions and copy also this. These are the I2C read and write functions. I scrolled too far, but everything is marked, so I can see Ctrl C, Ctrl V. Listing 7 doesn't have to be here. Let's have a look what we have here. The first function DS1307 read reads the eight registers from the DS1307 into the memory, into this variable block here. And it does so by actually starting the I2C communication to our DS1307. We call it by its address, which was defined as 0xd0 here. And we add the bit which tells the clock chip that we are going to write data to the clock chip over the I2C interface. And then we have, according to the data sheet, provided with a second piece of information, and that is the register location to which we want to write. And we want to start writing from register zero. That's why we have a zero there. That indicates we are going to write starting at register zero. Then we do a stop. So now actually we have told the, the chip that we want to address the first register, the register zero, but we stop then the communication after we have sent this. We wait a little bit and then we do a new start I2C. This time we now tell the chip on the other side, the clock chip, that we want to read data. And it will start to send out data from the register which we have previously selected, the register zero. So the first thing which we will get back when we now do an I2C read is the contents of register zero. Then the chip will automatically go and point to the next register, the register number one. And our next I2C read will give us the value from that register. And here in this loop, we will do this seven times. So we will read the registers zero to six. The last register, register 7, we will read in this line here, where we, with this 
index zero or the argument zero in the read tell the UR, the, the I2C hardware on both sides that this will be our last access reading access in this transmission block. So after which we will then stop the data transfer over the I2C. So this routine here reads out eight bytes from our clock chip. And here we have the similar routine, which actually will write eight bits of data from the variable DS1307 registers back to the clock chip by using the command I2C write. The rest is quite similar to what we did before, but we don't have to switch between the write and the read access as we had to do here. First, we transmitted the address from which we want to read with a write command, and then we start reading. In this case here, we only use the write. We tell the chip that we want to write starting with register zero, but then we are only sending the data. This is explained in pretty detail in the data sheet. Um, here, I2C data bus, here comes a whole chapter over how the data transmission um, has to be done uh, between the microcontroller and the clock chip. Um, so it's actually not only a data sheet, it's also a manual and an explanation on how I2C transfer works. So what else do we have now? What's left in our instructions? Well, I guess it should be a main because we haven't, we don't have anything in our main yet, or we have don't have anything in our init yet either. We don't have any hardware initialization. So let's do this as well. Go, ah, we, we try to get both of them, and then we just have to make sure that we get rid of unnecessary text in the middle. So like this, and we take this one out here in the middle, and let's see what we have. We have our init. We're initializing our display exactly the same way as we did before. We print out the text real-time clock on the display. Okay. Um, we do a hardware initialization of the I2C interface in our microcontroller, and we do or recall once the read function, which copies the eight registers from the clock chip into our microcontroller. So we are getting the status of all the eight registers into our microcontroller. And then we are checking whether the highest bit in the seconds register is a one. If this expression is true, we will be going into this part of the code. And in this part of the code, what are we what we are doing is that we take our constant values, which we defined here as 23, 20, uh, 32 on the 28th of November 21 and send this over as an initialization to the DS1307. So in the case that our clock chip was not running and was indicating this by having this bit, this bit set to a one, then we will actually overwrite, well, we will send the first time clock data to the clock chip in order to get it started. In the main, we are defining variables for all the data in our clock chip, for the year, the month, the day, the day of week, the hour, the minutes, and the seconds. And uh, we have down here the extraction from the BCD format of the clock chip into the standard 
binary format that our C code understands by using the from BSCD mode uh, macro which we defined before. And uh, so afterwards in these variables we have the seconds, the minutes, the hour, the day of week, the day, month and year. We define a 20 character long text buffer to be used with our sprintf here. And we go into our init function and do all the initialization here, which we just saw. Then we are in the endless while loop. And in this loop, we go repeatedly through the same procedure. We have a delay of 100 milliseconds here, uh, together with all the other delays, which comes from that these all the other things take time we go something like uh, five to seven times the proper approximately per second through this routine here even though our time will of course only change once per second um, but we are going a little bit more often through the the code than what we're expecting in changes down here, if we go back to the lowest part here, to the final part in the loop, we are going to position uh, zero in row number one on the display. So that's the first character of the second row, if you remember. That's where we previously had our received messages. And there we will print out the value of our buffer string which is assembled together in sprintf here. And here we have the placeholder templates for our time format. So we are printing out the hour, minute and second all in the same format here by using percentage sign indicates this is a format descriptor and then we have 0 to D. D stands for decimal format. So no hexadecimal or binary things, which sprintf also supports. We reserve two characters for each of these variables on the display. And we make sure that we get leading zeros if we have hours, minutes or seconds, which only would be one character long. So from zero seconds to nine seconds every minute, there's only one single digit which we need to print. But it looks nicer if we print these also with two digits, is zero, 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 one, zero, two, and so on, onto the display. And then we get 10, 11, 12, and so on, which, which takes two digits automatically. So, um, yeah, let's compile this code and uh, run it into the microcontroller. We get actually, by compiling this code here, we get four warnings. And these four warnings have to do with that we defined, not only defined, wait a second, the variables year, month, day, and day of week. We even assigned values to these variables without ever using them. So here our compiler really must think that we do something stupid by actually defining variables but never ever using them down here. You could do that. We could do that. We, I don't know. No, I, I don't. I will not do that today. I don't think. I, we, I, well, I don't know. Um, so we have compiled the code. Let's upload this code into our microcontroller and go over here. And we see real time clock. We waited a second and now we see that it tells us it's 224959, um, which is actually not quite true. It's already a quarter to midnight here. Um, so, but this indicated that actually our clock chip on our clock here was still running. 
So I can actually, if we now look, 21, 22, 23, I unplug the USB cable. And uh, when I re-plug it in, we actually see that our time here will continue from where it was. So now it's 2250. Um, I can even unplug it and I can unplug our clock module here. So the battery itself will actually keep it running. It has very low power consumption, but it is active now and counting up every second the value of the seconds register and then also doing all the necessary other calculations for getting the time right and the date. So if I put it in, we should be at 2251 something. So works even without external power. But this is not the correct time. So what I have shown some student groups is how we could trick our code into actually going into this routine here by just taking out this if sentence here. We can do something else as well. I take this code here and put it somewhere, wherever, it doesn't really matter. Let's put it at the end of our main loop here. But I only want to go into this, co uh, into this code if I have pressed and released the button, the S1 button, which is still, which is still connected. We have our S1 button here. So why not bring it to some function? And so I have to check for, for first I have to make sure that I set the pull up resistor for the port PD or pin D2. Um, this I do by actually doing a port D equals 0B 1, 2, 3, 4, 1, 2, 3, 4. Pull up for P, PD2. And uh, then, as we know, only when I press a button, I will get a zero in this bit position. When I'm not pressing the button, then actually uh, we have a one. So I put an if sentence here when the contents of pin D and 0 B 0 PD2 when this is false that means when actually there is a zero at this position that means that I have pressed the button falling here. What should it do then? It should do this. Indenting it, Almond style. So this is the opening and the closing parenthesis for this if sentence here. If this comparison gives us a zero, which means that the S1 button is pressed. Then I will read whatever I have defined as constants here. And in order to make it a little bit more correct, this would be probably a 50 now, 2350. And uh, then actually it will read these values and write it to the DS1307 as the new time for the chip to run from. We compile this code and actually something failed. Yes, I is undeclared in this function and this is true. I have the I value here in this loop, which I use but I didn't declare it in this part of code here. Well I could use a the shortcut to just define it for this for loop. I normally you 
in eight type. I normally don't like it like this. I know that some people actually love it to just define the running variable of a loop inside the loop itself. That's different tastes. Anyway, we only got warnings now, so our code compiled correctly. Um, we will upload this code into the microcontroller. Uh, yeah, into the microcontroller. We switch over and see our 225549. Now, when I press this button here, the clock should jump to 2350 or whatever I wrote into this register now. And there it is, there we are. 2350 is the new time which we set now. And if I now disconnect it, so 2350, 40 seconds, disconnect, reconnect, and it just continues to show the current time. 55. Now we should be at 2351, clearly. And there we are, yes. So this is a new time now inside our clock chip. Let's have a final brief look at uh, how the I2C communication looks on the bit level, uh, which is found also in the instructions here. So this is also taken with the same logic analyzer, the one I showed you before, and the pulse view software. And here we see the SDA, the data pin, and here we see the clock pin of the I2C interface. And this is the full communication between the microcontroller and the clock chip for one readout. So what we see here first is that our transmission starts with the start condition on the data and clock line. And then with every clock pulse, we are sending out one bit from the microcontroller to the clock chip. And the first thing which we are sending is here in um, cyan color, turquoise color. And this is D0, that is the hardware address of our clock chip. And this is sent as 11010000. So we have eight bits of data. Eight bits of data. And then we have uh, the, the lowest bit here. The last bit of the D0 address is actually indicating that we are going to write. It's a zero. If we look over here behind my face, then we see that in the second block, we are sending one one uh, it's hard to see here because it's overwritten but we see that the bit pattern is the same here so we are sending one one zero one zero 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 one and this one here means that our microcontroller wants to read from the clock chip here we want to write to the clock chip here we want to read from the clock chip our uh, my, my pulse view decoder here tells us even the difference in the different colors we see also it says a W address write, A R address read, data D W data write, D R data read. So here then we are sending a bunch of zeros to the clock chip, which was telling the clock chip that we want to start with address number zero. And then here comes the second part where we are sending the address D with the read bit, and then our clock chip sends back the data for register zero, register one, register two, three, and so on. We see the decoded values down here. We see it's two seconds, 56 minutes, 21 hours. Day of week is set as two. 
date is the 22nd November 20. So this was last year when I uh, captured this message because I probably set the clock to a date last year. Last year, and uh, so this is then the data which was sent. The status byte is the last one here, which is also just zeros. Um, and then we are actually exiting the transmission completely. So this was everything for today and uh, or tonight or tomorrow. I don't know. Um, that's it. See you again in lab seven.